Section six of Beacon Lights of History, Volume six, Renaissance and Reformation by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Christopher Columbus, Part two. Columbus leaves a small colony on the island of Hispaniola, and with the trophies of his discoveries returns to Spain without serious obstacles, except a short detention in Portugal, whither he was driven by a storm. His stories fill the whole civilized world with wonder. He is welcomed with the most cordial and enthusiastic reception. The people gaze at him with admiration. His sovereigns rise at his approach and seat him beside themselves on their gilded and canopied throne. He has made them a present worthy of a god. What honors could be too great for such a man? Even envy pales before the universal exhilaration. He enters into the most august circles as an equal. His dignities and honors are confirmed. He is loaded with presents and favors. He is the most marked personage in Europe. He is now almost stifled with the incense of royal and popular idolatry. Neither was a subject more honored and caressed. The imagination of a chivalrous and lively people is inflamed with the wildest expectations, for although he returned with but little of the expected wealth, he has pointed out a land rich in unfathomed mines. A second and larger expedition is soon projected. Everybody wishes to join it. All press to join the fortunate admiral who has added a continent to civilization. The proudest nobles, with the armor and horses of chivalry, embark with artisans and miners for another voyage, now without solicitude or fear, but with unbounded hopes of wealth, especially hardy adventurers and broken-down families of rank, anxious to retrieve their fortunes. The pendulum of a nation's thought swings from the extreme of doubt and cynicism to the opposite extreme of faith and exhilaration. Spain was ripe for the harvest. Eight hundred years' desperate contest with the Moors had made the nation bold, heroic, adventurous. There were no such warriors in all Europe. Nowhere were there such chivalric virtues. No people were then animated with such martial enthusiasm, such unfettered imagination, such heroic daring, as were the subjects of Ferdinand and Isabella. They were a people to conquer a world, not merely heroic and enterprising, but fresh with religious enthusiasm. They had expelled the infidels from Spain. They would fight for the honor of the cross in any clime or land. The hopes held out by Columbus were extravagant, and these extravagant expectations were the occasion of his fall and subsequent sorrows and humiliation. Doubtless he was sincere, but he was infatuated. He could only see the gold of Sapongo. He was as confident of enriching his followers as he had been of discovering new realms. He was as enthusiastic as Sir Walter Raleigh, a century later, and made promises as rash as he, and created the same exalted hopes, to be followed by bitter disappointments, and consequently he incurred the same hostilities and met the same downfall. This second expedition was undertaken in seventeen vessels, carrying fifteen hundred people, all full of animation and hope, and some of them with intentions to settle in the newly discovered country until they had made their fortunes. They arrived at Hispaniola in March of the year 1493, only to discover that the men left behind on the first voyage to secure their settlement were all despoiled or murdered, that the natives had proved treacherous, or that the Spaniards had abused their confidence and forfeited their friendship. They were exposed to new hostilities. They found the climate unhealthy. Their numbers rapidly dwindled away from disease or poor food. Starvation stared them in the face, in spite of the fertility of the soil dissensions and jealousies arose they were governed with great difficulty for the haughty hidalgos were unused to menial labor and labor of the most irksome kind was necessary law and order were relaxed the blame of disaster was laid upon the admiral who was accused of deceiving them evil reports were sent to spain accusing him of incapacity cruelty and oppression gold was found only in small quantities some of the leading men mutinied general discontent arose the greater part of the colonists were disabled from sickness and debility no gold of any amount was sent back to spain only five hundred indian slaves to be sold instead which led to renewed hostilities with the natives and the necessity for their subjugation all of these evils created bitter disappointment in spain and discontent with the measures and government of columbus himself so that a commission of inquiry was sent to española headed by aguado who assumed arrogant authority and made it necessary for columbus to return to spain without adding essentially to his discoveries 
he sailed around cuba and jamaica and other islands but as yet had not seen the mainland or found mines of gold or silver he landed in spain in fourteen ninety six to find that his popularity had declined and the old enthusiasm had grown cold with him landed a feeble train of emaciated men who had nothing to relate but sickness hardship and disappointment the sovereigns however received him kindly but he was depressed and sad and clothed himself with the habit of a franciscan friar to denote his humility and dejection he displayed a few golden collars and bracelets as trophies with some indians but these no longer dazzled the crowd it was not until fourteen ninety eight that columbus was enabled to make his third voyage having experienced great delay from the general disappointment instead of seventeen vessels he could collect but six in this voyage he reached the mainland that part called paria near the mouth of the orinoco in south america but he supposed it to be an island it was fruitful and populous and the air was sweetened with the perfumes of flowers yet he did not explore the coast to any extent but made his way to hispaniola where he had left the discontented colony himself broken in health a victim of gout haggard from anxiety and emaciated by pain his splendid constitution was now undermined from his various hardships and cares he found the colony in a worse state than when he left it under the care of his brother bartholomew the indians had proved hostile the colonists were lazy and turbulent mutiny had broken out factions prevailed as well as general misery and discontent the horrors of famine had succeeded wars with the natives there was a general desire to leave the settlement columbus tried to restore order and confidence but the difficulty of governing such a disorderly set of adventurers was too great even for him he was obliged to resort to severities that made him more and more unpopular the complaints of his enemies reached spain he was most cruelly misrepresented and slandered and in the general disappointment and the constant drain upon the mother country to support the colony his enemies gained the ear of his sovereigns and strong doubts arose in their minds about his capacity for government so a royal commission was set out an officer named bovadilla with absolute power to examine the state of the colony and supplant if necessary the authority of columbus the result was the arrest of columbus and his brothers who were sent to spain in chains what a change of fortune i will not detail the accusations against him just or unjust it is mournful enough to see the old man brought home in irons from the world he had discovered and given to spain the injustice and cruelty which he received produced a reaction and he was once more kindly received at court with the promise that his grievances should be redressed and his property and dignities restored columbus was allowed to make one more voyage of discovery but nothing came of it except renewed troubles hardships dangers and difficulties wars with the natives perils of the sea discontents disappointments and when he at last returned to spain in fifteen o four broken with age and infirmities after twelve years of harassing cares labors and dangers a checkered career of glory and suffering nothing remained but to prepare for his final rest he had not made a fortune he had not enriched his patrons but he had discovered a continent his last days were spent in disquieting and fruitless negotiations to perpetuate his honors among his descendants he was ever jealous and tenacious of his dignities ferdinand was polite but selfish and cold nor can this calculating prince ever be vindicated from the stain of gross ingratitude columbus died in the year fifteen o six at the age of sixty a disappointed man but honors were ultimately bestowed upon his heirs who became grandees and dukes and intermarried with the proudest families of spain and it is also said that ferdinand himself after the death of the great navigator caused a monument to be erected to his memory with this inscription to castile and leon columbus gave a new world but no man of that century needed less than columbus a monument to perpetuate his immortal fame i think that historians belittle columbus when they would excite our pity for his misfortunes they insult the dignity of all struggling souls and make utilitarians out of all benefactors and give false views of success few benefactors on the whole were ever more richly rewarded than he he died admiral of the seas a grandee of spain having bishops for his eulogists and princes for his mourners the founder of an illustrious house whose name and memory gave glory even to the spanish throne and even if he had not been rewarded with material gains it was enough to feel that he had conferred a benefit on the world which could scarcely be appreciated in his lifetime a benefit so transcendent that its results could be seen only by future generations 
who could adequately pay him for his services who could estimate the value of his gift what though they load him to-day with honors or cast him to-morrow into chains that is the fate of all immortal benefactors since our world began his great soul should have soared beyond vulgar rewards in the loftiness of his self-consciousness he should have accepted without a murmur whatever fortune awaited him had he merely given to civilization a new style of buttons or an improved envelope or a punch for a railway conductor or a spring for a carriage or a mining tool or a screw or revolver or reaper the adventures of which have seen millions in them and been cheated out of his gains he might have whimpered over his wrongs how few benefactors have received even as much as he for he won dignities admiration and undying fame we scarcely know the names of many who have made grand bequests who invented the mariner's compass who gave the lyre to primeval ages or the blacksmith's forge or the letters of the alphabet or the arch in architecture or the glass for windows who solved the first problem of geometry who first sang the odes which homer incorporated with the iliad who first turned up the earth with a plough who first used the weaver's shuttle who devised the cathedral of the middle ages who gave the keel to ships who was the first that raised bread by yeast who invented chimneys but all ages will know that columbus discovered america and his monuments are in every land and his greatness is painted by the ablest historians but i will not enlarge on the rewards columbus received or the ingratitude which succeeded them by force of envy or from the disappointment of worldly men in not realizing all the gold that he promised let me allude to the results of his discovery the first we noticed was the marvelous stimulus to maritime adventures europe was inflamed with a desire to extend geographical knowledge or add new countries to the realms of european sovereigns within four years of the discovery of the west india islands by columbus cabot had sailed past newfoundland and vasco da gama had doubled the cape of good hope and laid the foundation of the portuguese empire in the east indies in fourteen ninety nine ojeda one of the companions of columbus and amerigo vespucci discovered brazil in fifteen hundred corte real a portuguese explored the gulf of st lawrence in fifteen o five francesco de almiera established factories along the coast of malabar in fifteen ten the spaniards formed settlements on the mainland at panama in fifteen eleven the portuguese established themselves at malacca in fifteen thirteen balboa crossed the isthmus of darien and reached the pacific ocean the year after that ponce de leon had visited florida in fifteen fifteen the rio de la plata was navigated and in fifteen seventeen the portuguese had begun to trade with china and bengal as early as fifteen twenty cortez had taken mexico and completed the conquest of that rich country the following year in fifteen twenty two cano circumnavigated the globe in fifteen twenty four pizarro discovered peru which in less than twelve years was completely subjugated the year when california was discovered by cortez in fifteen forty two the portuguese were admitted to trade with japan in fifteen seventy six frobisher sought a northwestern passage to india and the following year sir francis drake commenced his more famous voyages under the auspices of elizabeth in fifteen seventy eight sir humphrey gilbert colonized virginia followed rapidly by other english settlements until before the century closed the whole continent was colonized either by spaniards or portuguese or english or french or dutch all countries came in to share the prizes held out by the discovery of the new world colonization followed the voyages of discovery it was animated by the hope of finding gold and precious stones it was carried on under great discouragements and hardships and unforeseen difficulties as a general thing the colonists were not accustomed to manual labor they were adventurers and broken-down dependents on great families who found restraint irksome and the drudgeries of their new life almost unendurable nor did they intend at the outset permanent settlements they expected to accumulate gold and silver and then return to their country they had sought to improve their condition and their condition became forlorn they were exposed to sickness from malaria poor food and hardship they were molested by the natives whom they constantly provoked they were subject to cruel treatment on the part of royal governors they melted away wherever they settled by famine disease and war whether in south or north america they were discontented and disappointed and not easily governed the chieftains quarreled with each other and were disgraced by rapacity and cruelty they did not find what they expected they were lonely and desolate and longed to return to the homes they had left but were frequently without means to return 
doomed to remain where they were and die colonization had no dignity until men went to the new world for religious liberty or to work upon the soil the conquest of mexico and peru however opened up the mining of gold and silver which were finally found in great abundance and when the richness of these countries in the precious metals was finally established then a regular stream of immigrants flocked to the american shores gold was at last found but not until thousands had miserably perished the mines of mexico and peru undoubtedly enriched spain and filled europe with envy and emulation a stream of gold flowed to the mother country and the caravels which transported the treasures of the new world became objects of plunder to all nations hostile to spain the seas were full of pirates sir francis drake was an undoubted pirate and returned after his long voyage around the world with immense treasure which he had stolen then followed with the eager search after gold and silver a rapid demoralization in all maritime countries it would be interesting to show how the sudden accumulation of wealth by spain led to luxury arrogance and idleness followed by degeneracy and decay since those virtues on which the strength of man is based are weakened by sudden wealth industry declined in proportion as spain became enriched by the precious metals but this inquiry is foreign to my object a still more interesting inquiry arises how far the nations of europe were really enriched by the rapid accumulation of gold and silver the search for the precious metals may have stimulated commercial enterprise but it is not so clear that it added to the substantial wealth of europe except so far as it promoted industry gold is not wealth it is simply the exponent of wealth real wealth is in farms and shops and ships in the various channels of industry in the results of human labor so far as the precious metals enter into useful manufactures or into articles of beauty and taste they are indeed inherently valuable mirrors plate jewelry watches gilded furniture the adornments of the person in an important sense constitute wealth since all nations value them and will pay for them as they do for corn or oil so far as they are connected with art they are valuable in the same sense as statues and pictures on which labor has been expended there is something useful and even necessary besides food and raiment and houses the gold which ornamented solomon's temple or the minerva of phidias or the garments of leo the tenth had a value the ring which is a present to brides is a part of a marriage ceremony the golden watch which never tarnishes is more valuable inherently than a pewter one because it remains beautiful thus when gold enters into ornaments deemed indispensable or into manufactures which are needed it has an inherent value it is wealth but when gold is a mere medium of exchange its chief use then it has only a conventional value I mean it does not make a nation rich or poor since the rarer it is the more it will purchase of the necessaries of life a pound's weight of gold in ancient greece or in medieval europe would purchase as much as wheat as twenty pounds weight will purchase today if the mines of mexico or peru or california had never been worked the gold in the civilized world three hundred years ago would have been as valuable for banking purposes or as an exchange for agricultural products as twenty times its present quantity since it would have bought as much as twenty times the quantity will buy today make diamonds as plenty as crystals they would be worth no more than crystals if they were not harder and more beautiful make gold as plenty as silver it would be worth no more than silver except for manufacturing purposes it would be worth no more to bankers and merchants the vast increase in the production of the precious metals simply increased the value of the commodities for which they were exchanged a laborer can purchase no more bread with a dollar today than he could with five cents three hundred years ago five cents were really as much wealth three hundred years ago as a dollar is today wherein then has the increase in the precious metals added to the wealth of the world if a twentieth part of the gold and silver now in circulation would buy as much land or furniture or wheat or oil three hundred years ago as the whole amount now used as money will buy today had no gold or silver mines been discovered in america the gold and silver would have appreciated in value in proportion to the wear of them in other words the scarcer the gold and silver the more the same will purchase of the fruits of human industry so industry is the wealth not the gold it is the cultivated farms and the manufactures and the buildings and the internal improvements of a country which constitutes its real wealth since these represent its industry the labor of men mines indeed employ the labor of men but they do not furnish food for the body or raiment to wear or houses to live in or fuel for cooking or any purpose whatever of human comfort or necessity only a material for ornament which i grant is wealth so far as ornament is for the welfare of man 
the marbles of ancient greece were very valuable for the labor expended on them either for architecture or for ornament end of section six section seven of beacon lights of history volume six renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand christopher columbus part three gold and silver were early selected as useful and convenient articles for exchange like bank notes and so far have inherent value as they supply that necessity but if a fourth part of the gold and silver in existence would supply that necessity the remaining three-fourths are as inherently valueless as the paper on which bank notes are printed their value consists in what they represent of the labors and industries of men now spain ultimately became poor in spite of the influx of gold and silver from the american mines because industries of all kinds declined people were diverted from useful callings by the mighty delusion which gold discoveries created these discoveries had the same effect on industry which is the wealth of nations as the support of standing armies has in our day they diverted men from legitimate callings the miners had to be supported like soldiers and worse the sudden influx of gold and silver intoxicated men and stimulated speculation an army of speculators do not enrich a nation since they rob each other they cause money to change hands they do not stimulate industry they do not create wealth they simply make it flow from one person to another but speculations sometimes create activity in enterprise they inflame desires for wealth and cause people to make greater exertions in that sense the discovery of american mines gave a stimulus to commerce and travel and energy people rushed to america for gold these people had to be fed and clothed then farmers and manufacturers followed the gold hunters they tilled the soil to feed the miners the new farms which dotted the region of the gold diggers added to the wealth of the country in which the mines were located colonization followed gold digging but it was america that became enriched not the old countries from which the miners came except so far as the old countries furnished tools and ships and fabrics for doubtless commerce and manufacturing were stimulated so far the wealth of the world increased but the men who returned to riot in luxury and idleness did not stimulate enterprise they made others idle also the necessity of labor was lost sight of and yet if one country became idle another country may have become industrious there can be but little question that the discovery of the american mines gave commerce and manufactures and agriculture on the whole a stimulus this was partly seen in england england grew rich from industry and enterprise as spain became poor from idleness and luxury the silver and gold diffused throughout europe ultimately found their way into the pockets of englishmen who made a market for the manufacturers it was not alone the precious metals which enriched england but the will and power to produce those articles of industry for which the rest of the world parted with their gold and silver what has made france rich since the revolution those innumerable articles of taste and elegance fabrics and wines for which all europe parted with their specie not war not conquest not mines why till recently was germany so poor because it had so little to sell to other nations because industry was cramped by standing armies and despotic governments one thing is certain that the discovery of america opened a new field for industry and enterprise to all the discontented and impoverished and oppressed europeans who emigrated at first they emigrated to dig silver and gold the opening of mines required labor and miners were obliged to part with their gold for the necessities of life thus california in our day has become peopled with farmers and merchants and manufacturers as well as miners many came to america expecting to find gold and were disappointed and were obliged to turn agriculturists as in virginia many came to new england from political and religious motives but all came to better their fortunes gradually the united states and canada became populated from east to west and from north to south the surplus population of europe poured itself into the wilds of america generally the immigrants were farmers with the growth of agricultural industry were developed commerce and manufacturers thus materially the world was immensely benefited a new continent was open for industry no matter what the form of government may be i might also say no matter what the morals and religion of the people may be so long as there is land to occupy and to be sold cheap the continent will fill up and will be as densely populated as europe or asia because the natural advantages are good the rivers and the lakes will be navigated the products of the country will be exchanged for european and asiatic products wealth will certainly increase and increase indefinitely 
there is no calculating the future resources and wealth of the new world especially in the united states there are no conceivable bounds to their future commerce manufactures and agricultural products we can predict with certainty the rise of new cities villas palaces material splendor limited only to the increasing resources and population of the country who can tell the number of miles of new railroads yet to be made the new inventions to abridge human labor what great empires are destined to rise what unknown forms of luxury will be found out what new and magnificent trophies of art and science will gradually be seen what mechanism what material glories are sure to come this is not speculation nothing can retard the growth of america and material wealth and glory the splendid external will call forth more panegyrics than the old roman world which fancied itself eternal the tower of the new babel will rise to the clouds and be seen in all its glory throughout the earth and sea no fourth of july orator ever exaggerated the future destinies of america in a material point of view no spread eagle politician even conceived what will be sure to come and what then grant the most indefinite expansion the growth of empires whose splendor and wealth and power shall utterly eclipse the glories of the old world all this is probable but when we have dwelt on the future material expansion when we have given wings to imagination and feel that even imagination cannot reach the probable realities from a material aspect then our predictions and calculations stop beyond material glories we cannot count with certainty the world has witnessed many powerful empires which have passed away and left not a rack behind what remains of the antediluvian world not even a spike of noah's ark larger and stronger than any modern ship what remains of nineveh of babylon of thebes of tyre of carthage those great centers of wealth and power what remains of roman greatness even except in laws and literature and renovated statues remember there is an undeviating uniformity in the past history of nations what is the simple story of all the ages industry wealth corruption decay and ruin what conservative power has been strong enough to arrest the ruin of the nations of antiquity have not material forces and glories been developed and exhibited whatever the religion and morals of the fallen nations cannot a country grow materially to a certain point under the most adverse influences in a religious and moral point of view yet for a lack of religion and morals the nations perished and their babel towers were buried in the dust they perished for lack of true conservative forces at least that is the judgment of historians no one doubts the splendor of the material glories of the ancient nations the ruins of baalbek of palmyra of athens prove this to say nothing of history the material glories of the ancient nations may be surpassed by our modern wonders but yet all the material glories of the ancient nations passed away now if this is to be the destiny of america an unbounded material growth followed by corruption and ruin then columbus has simply extended the realm for men to try material experiments make new york a second carthage and boston a second athens and philadelphia a second antioch and washington a second rome and we simply repeat the old experiments did not the romans have nearly all we have materially except our modern scientific inventions but has america no higher destiny than to repeat the old experiments and improve upon them and become rich and powerful has she no higher and nobler mission can she lay hold of forces that the old world never had such as will prevent the uniform doom of nations i maintain that there is no reason that can be urged based on history and experience why she should escape the fate of the nations of antiquity unless new forces arise on this continent different from what the world has known and which have a conservative influence if america has a great mission to declare and fulfill she must put forth altogether new forces and these not material and these alone will save her and save the world it is mournful to contemplate even the future magnificent material glories of america if these are not to be preserved if these are to share the fate of ancient wonders it is obvious that the real glory of america is to be something entirely different from that of which the ancients boasted and this is to be moral and spiritual that which the ancients lacked this leads me to speak of the moral consequences of the discovery of america infinitely grander than any material wonders of which the world has been full of which every form of paganism has boasted which nearly everywhere has perished and which must necessarily perish everywhere without new forces to preserve them in a moral point of view scarcely anything good immediately resulted at least to europe by the discovery of america 
it excited the wildest spirit of adventure the most unscrupulous cupidity the most demoralizing speculation it created jealousies and wars the cruelties and injustices inflicted on the indians were revolting nothing in the annals of the world exceeds the wickedness of the spaniards in the conquest of peru and mexico that conquest is the most dismal and least glorious in human history we see in it no poetry or heroism or necessity we read of nothing but its crimes the jesuits in their missionary zeal partly redeemed the cruelties but they soon imposed a despotic yoke and made their religion pay monopolies scandalously increased and the new world was regarded only as spoil the tone of moral feeling was lowered everywhere for the nations were crazed with the hope of sudden accumulations spain became enervated and demoralized on america itself the demoralization was even more marked there never was such a state of moral degradation in any christian country as in south america three centuries have passed and the low state of morals continues contrast mexico and peru with the united states morally and intellectually what seeds of vice did not the spaniards plant how the old natives melted away and then to add to the moral evils attending colonization was the introduction of african slaves especially in the west indies and the southern states of north america christendom seems to have lost the sense of morality slavery more than counterbalances all other advantages together it was the stain of the seventeenth and eighteenth centuries not merely slaves but the slave trade increased the horrors of the frightful picture america became associated in the minds of europeans with gold hunting slavery and cruelty to indians better that the country had remained undiscovered than that such vices and miseries should be introduced into the most fertile parts of the new world i cannot see that civilization gained anything morally by the discovery of america until the new settlers were animated by other motives than a desire for sudden wealth when the country became colonized by men who sought liberty to worship god men of lofty purposes willing to undergo sufferings and danger in order to plant the seeds of a higher civilization then there arose new forms of social and political life such men were those who colonized new england and say what you will in spite of all the disagreeable sides of the puritan character it was the puritans who gave a new impulse to civilization in its higher sense they founded schools and colleges and churches they introduced a new form of political life by their town meetings in which liberty was nurtured and all local improvements were regulated it was the autonomy of towns on which the political structure of new england rested in them was born that true representative government which has gradually spread towards the west the colonies were embryo states states afterwards to be bound together by a stronger tie than that of a league the new england states after the war of independence were the defenders and advocates of a federal and central power an entirely new political organization was gradually formed resting equally on such pillars as independent townships and independent states and these represented by delegates in a national center so we believe america was discovered not so much to furnish a field for indefinite material expansion with european arts and fashions which would simply assimilate america to the old world with all its dangers and vices and follies but to introduce new forms of government new social institutions new customs and manners new experiments in liberty new religious organizations new modes to ameliorate the necessary evils of life it was discovered that men might labor and enjoy the fruits of industry in a new mode unfettered by the restraints which the institutions of europe imposed america is a new field in which to try experiments in government and social life which cannot be tried in the older nations without sweeping and dangerous revolutions and new institutions have arisen which are our pride and boast and which are the wonder and admiration of europe america is the only country under the sun in which there is a self-government a government which purely represents the wishes of the people where universal suffrage is not a mockery and if america has a destiny to fulfill for other nations she must give them something more valuable than reaping machines palace cars and horse railroads she must give not only machinery to abridge labor but institutions and ideas to expand the mind and elevate the soul something by which the poor can rise and assert their rights unless something is developed here which cannot be developed in other countries in the way of new spiritual and intellectual forces which have a conservative influence then i cannot see how america can long continue to be the home and refuge of the poor and miserable of other lands 
a new and better spirit must vivify schools and colleges and philanthropic enterprises than that which has prevailed in older nations unless something new is born here which has a peculiar power to save wherein will america ultimately differ from other parts of christendom we must have schools in which the heart as well as the brain is educated and newspapers which aspire to something higher than to fan prejudices and appeal to perverted tastes our hope is not in books which teach infidelity under the name of science nor in pulpits which cannot be sustained without sensational oratory nor in journals which trade on the religious sentiments of the people nor in sabbath school books which are an insult to the human understanding nor in colleges which fit youth merely for making money nor in schools of technology to give an impulse to material interests nor in legislatures controlled by monopolists nor in judges elected by demagogues nor in philanthropic societies to ventilate unpractical theories these will neither renovate nor conserve what is most precious in life unless a nation grows morally as well as materially there is something wrong at the core of society as i have said no material expansion will avail if society becomes rotten at the core america is a glorious boon to civilization but only as she fulfills a new mission in history not to become more potent in material forces but in those spiritual agencies which prevent corruption and decay an infidel professor calling himself a savant may tell you that there is nothing certain or great but in the direction of science to utilities even as he may glory in a philosophy which ignores a creator and takes cognizance only of a creation as i survey the growing and enormous moral evils which degrade society here as everywhere in spite of bunker hills and plymouth rocks and all the windy declamations of politicians and philanthropists and all the advance in useful mechanisms i am sometimes tempted to propound inquiries which suggest the old mournful story of the decline and ruin of states and empires i ask myself why should america be an exception to the uniform fate of nations as history has demonstrated why should not good institutions be perverted here as in all other countries and ages of the world where has civilization shown any striking triumphs except in inventions to abridge the labors of mankind and make men comfortable and rich is there nothing before us then but the triumphs of material life to end as mournfully as the materialism of antiquity if so then christianity is a most dismal failure is a defeated power like all other forms of religion which failed to save but is it a failure are we really swinging back to paganism is the time to be hailed when all religions will be considered by the philosopher as equally false and equally useful is there nothing more cheerful for us to contemplate than what the old pagan philosophy holds out man destined to live like brutes or butterflies and pass away into the infinity of time and space like inert matter decomposed absorbed and entering into new and everlasting combinations is america to become like europe and asia in all essential elements of life has she no other mission than to add to perishable glories is she to teach the world nothing new in education and philanthropy and government are all her struggles in behalf of liberty in vain we all know that christianity is the only hope of the world the question is whether america is or is not more favorable for its healthy developments and applications than the other countries of christendom are we believe that it is if it is not then america is only a new field for the spread and triumph of material forces if it is we may look forward to such improvements in education in political institutions in social life in religious organizations in philanthropical enterprise that the country will be sought by the poor and enslaved classes of europe more for its moral and intellectual advantages than for its mines or farms the objects of the puritan settlers will be gained and the grandeur of the discovery of a new world will be established what sought they thus afar bright jewels of the mind the wealth of seas the spoils of war they sought for faith's pure shrine i call it holy ground the soil where first they trod they've left unstained what there they found freedom to worship god authorities prescott's ferdinand and isabella washington irving cabot's voyages and other early navigators columbus by de costa life of columbus by bossi and spatano relations de quatre voyage pour christopher colomb drake's world encompassed murray's historical account of discoveries hernando Historia del Amirante, History of Commerce, Lives of Pizarro and Cortes, 
Frobisher's Voyages. Histories of Herrera, Las Casas, Gomera, and Peter Martyr. Navarrete's Collections. Memoir of Cabot by Richard Biddle. Hack Lutz Voyages. Dr. Lardner's Cyclopedia. History of Maritime and Inland Discovery. Anderson's History of Commerce. Oviedo's General History of the West Indies. History of the New World by Geronimo Benzoni. Goodrich's Life of Christopher Columbus. End of section 7. Section 8 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Savonarola, Part 1. A.D. 1452 to 1498. Unsuccessful Reforms. This lecture is intended to set forth a memorable movement in the Roman Catholic Church a reformation of morals preceding the greater movement of luther to produce a reformation of both morals and doctrines as the representative of this movement i take savonarola concerning whom much has of late been written more i think because he was a florentine in a remarkable age the age of artists and of reviving literature than because he was a martyr battling with evils which no one man was capable of removing his life was more a protest than a victory he was an unsuccessful reformer and yet he prepared the way for that religious revival which afterward took place in the catholic church itself his spirit was not revolutionary like that of the saxon monk and yet it was progressive his soul was in active sympathy with every emancipating idea of his age he was the incarnation of a fervid living active piety amid forms and formulas a fearless exposer of all shams an uncompromising enemy to the blended atheism and idolatry of his ungodly age he was the contemporary of political worldly warlike unscrupulous popes disgraced by nepotism and personal vices men who aimed to extend not a spiritual but temporal dominion and who scandalized the highest position in the christian world as attested by all reliable historians whether catholic or protestant however infallible the catholic church claims to be it has never been denied that some of their highest dignities have been subject to grave reproaches both in their character and their influence such men were sixtus the fourth julius the second and alexander the sixth able probably for it is very seldom that the popes have not been distinguished for something but men nevertheless who were a disgrace to the superb position they had succeeded in reaching the great feature of that age was the revival of classical learning and artistic triumphs in sculpture painting and architecture blended with infidel levity and social corruptions so that it is both interesting and hideous it is interesting for its triumphs of genius its dispersion of the shadows of the middle ages the commencement of great enterprises and of a marked refinement of manners and tastes it is hideous for its venalities its murders its debaucheries its unblushing wickedness and its disgraceful levities when god and duty and self-restraint were alike ignored cruel tyrants reigned in cities and rapacious priests fattened on the credulity of the people think of monks itinerating europe to sell indulgences for sin of monasteries and convents filled not with sublime enthusiasts as in earlier times but with gluttons and sensualists living in concubinage and greedy of the very things which primitive monasticism denounced and abhorred think of boys elevated to episcopal thrones and the sons of popes made cardinals and princes think of churches desecrated by spectacles which were demoralizing and a worship of saints and images which had become idolatrous a degrading superstition among the people an infidel apathy among the higher classes not infidel speculations for these were reserved for more enlightened times but what an indifference to what is ennobling to all vital religion worthy of the sophists in the time of socrates it was in this age of religious apathy and scandalous vices yet of awakening intelligence and artistic glories when the greatest enthusiasm was manifested for the revived literature and sculptured marbles of classic greece and rome that savonarola appeared in florence as a reformer and preacher and statesman near the close of the fifteenth century when columbus was seeking a western passage to india when michelangelo was moulding the battle of hercules with the centaurs when ficino was teaching the philosophy of plato when alexander the sixth was making princes of his natural children 
when Bramante was making plans for a new St. Peter's, when Cardinal Bembo was writing Latin essays, when Lorenzo de Medici was the flattered patron of both scholars and artists, and the city over which he ruled with so much magnificence was the most attractive place in Europe, next to that other city on the banks of the Tiber, whose wonders and glories have never been exhausted, and will probably survive the revolutions of unknown empires. But Savonarola was not a native of Florence. He was born in the year 1452 at Ferrara, belonged to a good family, and received an expensive education, being destined to the profession of medicine. He was a sad, solitary, pensive, but precocious young man, whose youth was marked by an unfortunate attachment to a haughty Florentine girl. He did not cherish her memory and dedicate to her a life labor like Dante, but became very dejected and very pious. His piety assumed, of course, the ascetic type, for there was scarcely any other in that age, and he entered a Dominican convent, as Luther, a few years later, entered an Augustinian. But he was not an original genius, or a bold and independent thinker like Luther, so he was not emancipated from the ideas of his age. How few men can go counter to prevailing ideas! It takes a prodigious genius, and a fearless inquiring mind, to break away from their bondage abraham could renounce the idolatries which surrounded him when called by a supernatural voice paul could give up the pharisaism which reigned in the jewish schools and synagogues when stricken blind by the hand of god luther could break away from monastic rules and papal denunciation when taught by the bible the true ground of justification but savonarola could not he pursued the path to heaven in the beaten track after the fashion of jerome and bernard and thomas aquinas after the style of the middle ages and was sincere devout and lofty like the saints of the fifth century and read his bible as they did and essayed a high religious life but he was stern gloomy and austere emaciated by fasts and self-denial he had however those passive virtues which the mediaeval piety ever enjoined yea which christ himself preached upon the mount and which protestantism in the arrogance of reason is in danger of losing sight of humility submission and contempt of material gains he won the admiration of his superiors for his attainments and his piety being equally versed in aristotle and the holy scriptures he delighted most in the old testament heroes and prophets and caught their sternness and invective he was not so much interested in dogmas as he was in morals he had not indeed a turn of mind for theology like anselm and calvin but he took a practical view of the evils of society at thirty years of age he began to preach in ferrara and florence but was not very successful his sermons at first created but little interest and he sometimes preached to as few as twenty-five people probably he was too rough and vehement to suit the fastidious ears of the most refined city in italy people will not ordinarily bear uncouthness from preachers however gifted until they have earned a reputation they prefer pretty and polished young men with nothing but platitudes or extravagances to utter savonarola seems to have been discouraged and humiliated at his failure and was sent to preach to the rustic villagers amid the mountains near siena among these people he probably felt more at home and he gave vent to the fire within him and electrified all who heard him winning even the admiration of the celebrated prince of mirandola from this time his fame spread rapidly he was recalled to florence fourteen ninety and his great career commenced in the following year such crowds pressed to hear him that the church of st mark connected with the dominican convent to which he was attached could not contain the people and he repaired to the cathedral and even that spacious church was filled with eager listeners more moved than delighted so great was his popularity that his influence correspondingly increased and he was chosen prior of his famous convent he now wielded power as well as influence and became the most marked man of the city he was not only the most eloquent preacher in italy probably in the world but his eloquence was marked by boldness earnestness almost fierceness like an ancient prophet he was terrible in his denunciation of vices he spared no one and he feared no one he resembled chrysostom at constantinople when he denounced the vanity of eudoxia and the venality of eutropius lorenzo de medici the absolute lord of florence sent for him and expostulated and remonstrated with the unsparing preacher all to no effect and when the usurper of his country's liberties was dying the preacher was again sent for this time to grant an absolution but savonarola would grant no absolution unless lorenzo would restore the liberties which he and his family had taken away 
the dying tyrant was not prepared to accede to so haughty a demand and collecting his strength rolled over on his bed without saying a word and the austere monk wended his way back to his convent unmolested and determined the premature death of this magnificent prince made a great sensation throughout italy and produced a change in the politics of florence for the people began to see their political degradation the popular discontents were increased when his successor pietro proved himself incapable and tyrannical abandoned himself to orgies and insulted the leading citizens by an overwhelming pride savonarola took the side of the people and fanned the discontents he became the recognized leader of opposition to the medici and virtually ruled the city the prior of st mark now appeared in a double light as a political leader and as a popular preacher let us first consider him in his secular aspect as a revolutionist and statesman for the admirable constitution he had a principal hand in framing entitles him to the dignity of statesman rather than politician if his cause had not been good and if he had not appealed to both enlightened and patriotic sentiments he would have been a demagogue for a demagogue and a mere politician are synonymous and a clerical demagogue is hideous savonarola began his political career with terrible denunciations from his cathedral pulpit of the political evils of his day not merely in florence but throughout italy he detested tyrants and usurpers and sought to conserve such liberties as the florentines had once enjoyed he was not only the preacher he was also the patriot things temporal were mixed up with things spiritual in his discourses in his detestation of the tyranny of the medici and his zeal to recover for the florentines their lost liberties he even hailed the french armies of charles the eighth as deliverers although they had crossed the alps to invade and conquer italy if the gates of florence were open to them they would expel the medici so he stimulated the people to league with foreign enemies in order to recover their liberties this would have been high treason in richelieu's time as when the huguenots encouraged the invasion of the english on the soil of france savonarola was a zealot and carried the same spirit into politics that he did into religion such as when he made a bonfire of what he called vanities he had an end to carry he would use any means there is apt to be a spirit of jesuitism in all men consumed with zeal determined on success to the eye of the florentine reformer the expulsion of the medici seemed the supremest necessity and if it could be done in no other way than by opening the gates of his city to the french invaders he would open the gates whatever he commanded from the pulpit was done by the people for he seemed to have supreme control over them gained by his eloquence as a preacher but he did not abuse his power when the medici were expelled he prevented violence blood did not flow in the streets order and law were preserved the people looked up to him as their leader temporal as well as spiritual so he assembled them in the great hall of the city where they formerly held a parlamento and reinstated the ancient magistrates but these were men without experience they had no capacity to govern and they were selected without wisdom on the part of the people the people in fact had not the ability to select their best and wisest men for rulers that is an evil inherent in all popular governments does san francisco or new york send its greatest men to congress do not our cities elect such rulers as the demagogues point out do not the few rule even in a congregational church if some commanding genius unscrupulous or wise or eloquent or full of tricks controls elections with us much more easily could such a man as savonarola rule in florence where there were no political organizations no caucuses no wire pullers no other man of commanding ability the only opinion maker was this preacher who indicated the general policy to be pursued he left elections to the people and when these proved a failure a new constitution became a necessity but where were the men capable of framing a constitution for the republic two generations of political slavery had destroyed political experience the citizens were as incapable of framing a new constitution as the legislators of france after they had decimated the nobility confiscated the church lands and cut off the head of the king the lawyers disputed in the town hall but accomplished nothing their science amounted only to an analysis of human passion all wanted a government entirely free from tyranny all expected impossibilities some were in favor of a venetian aristocracy and others of a pure democracy yet none would yield to compromise without which no permanent political institution can ever be framed how could the inexperienced citizens of florence comprehend the complicated relations of governments to make a constitution that the world respects requires the highest maturity of human wisdom it is the supremest labor of great men it took the ablest man ever born among the jews to give them a national polity 
the roman constitution was the fruit of five hundred years experience our constitution was made by the wisest most dignified most enlightened body of statesmen that this country has yet seen and even then they could not have made it without great mutual concessions no one man could have made a constitution however great his talents and experience not even a jefferson or a hamilton which the nation would have accepted it would have been as full of defects as the legislation of solon or lycurgus or the abbe sais but one man gave a constitution to the florentines which they not only accepted but which has been generally admired for its wisdom and that man was our dominican monk the hand he had in shaping that constitution not only proved him to have been a man of great wisdom but entitled him to the gratitude of his countrymen as a benefactor he saw the vanity of political science as it then existed the incapacity of popular leaders and the sadness of a people drifting into anarchy and confusion and strong in his own will and his sense of right he rose superior to himself and directed the stormy elements of passion and fear and this he did by his sermons from the pulpit for he did not descend in person into the stormy arena of contending passions and interests he did not himself attend the deliberations in the town hall he was too wise and dignified a man for that but he preached those principles and measures which he wished to see adopted and so great was the reverence for him that the people listened to his instructions and afterward deliberated and acted among themselves he did not write out a code but he told the people what they should put into it he was the animating genius of the city his voice was obeyed he unfolded the theory that the government of one man in their circumstances would become tyrannical and he taught the doctrine then new that the people were the only source of power that they alone had the right to elect their magistrates he therefore recommended a general government which should include all citizens who had intelligence experience and position not all the people but such as had been magistrates or their fathers before them accordingly a grand council was formed of three thousand citizens out of a population of ninety thousand who had reached the age of twenty-nine these three thousand citizens were divided into three equal bodies each of which should constitute a council for six months and no meeting was legal unless two-thirds of the members were present this grand council appointed the magistrates but another council was also recommended and adopted of only eighty citizens not under forty years of age picked men to be changed every six months whom the magistrates were bound to consult weekly and to whom was confided the appointment of some of the higher offices of the state like ambassadors to the neighboring states all laws proposed by the magistrates or seigneury had to be ratified by this higher and selector council the higher council was a sort of senate the lower council were more like representatives but there was no universal suffrage the clerical legislator knew well enough that only the better and more intelligent part of the people were fit to vote even in the election of magistrates he seems to have foreseen the fatal rock on which all popular institutions are in danger of being wrecked that no government is safe and respected when the people who make it are ignorant and lawless so the constitution which savonarola gave was neither aristocratic nor democratic it resembled that of venice more than that of athens that of england more than that of the united states strictly universal suffrage is a utopian dream wherever a majority of the people are wicked and degraded sooner or later it threatens to plunge any nation as nations now are into a whirlpool of dangers even if divine providence may not permit a nation to be stranded and wrecked altogether in the politics of savonarola we see great wisdom and yet great sympathy for freedom he would give the people all they were fit for he would make all offices elective but only by the suffrages of the better part of the people but the prior of st mark did not confine himself to constitutional questions and issues alone he would remove all political abuses he would tax property and put an end to forced loans and arbitrary imposts he would bring about a general pacification and grant a general amnesty for political offences he would guard against the extortions of the rich and the usury of the jews who lent money at thirty three per cent with compound interest he secured the establishment of a bank for charitable loans he sought to make the people good citizens and to advance their temporal as well as spiritual interests all his reforms political or social were advocated however from the pulpit so that he was doubtless a political priest we in this country and in these times have no very great liking to this union of spiritual and temporal authority we would separate and divide this authority protestants would make the functions of the ruler and the priest forever distinct but at that time the popes themselves were secular rulers as well as spiritual dignitaries all bishops and abbots had the charge of political interests courts of law were presided over by priests 
priests were ambassadors to foreign powers they were ministers of kings they had the control of innumerable secular affairs now entrusted to laymen so their interference with politics did not shock the people of florence or the opinions of the age it was indeed imperatively called for since the clergy were the most learned and influential men of those times even in affairs of the state i doubt if the catholic church has ever abrogated or ignored her old right to meddle in the politics of a state or nation i do not know but apprehend that the catholic clergy even in this country take it upon themselves to instruct the people in their political duties no enlightened protestant congregation would endure this interference no protestant minister dares ever to discuss direct political issues from the pulpit except perhaps on thanksgiving day or in some rare exigency in public affairs still less would he venture to tell his parishioners how they should vote in town meetings in imitation of ancient saints and apostles he is wisely constrained from interference in secular and political affairs but in the middle ages and the catholic church the priest could be political in his preaching since many of his duties were secular savonarola usurped no prerogatives he refrained from meeting men in secular vocations even in his politics he confined himself to his sphere in the pulpit he did not attend the public debates he simply preached he ruled by wisdom eloquence and sanctity and as he was an oracle his utterances became a law but while he instructed the moral people in political duties he paid far more attention to public morals he would break up luxury extravagance ostentatious living unseemly dresses in the house of god he was the foe of all levities all frivolities all insidious pleasures bad men found no favor in his eyes and he exposed their hypocrisies and crimes he denounced sin in high places and low he did not confine himself to the sins of his own people alone but censured those of princes and of other cities he embraced all italy in his glance he invoked the lord to take the church out of the hands of the devil to pour out his wrath on guilty cities he throws down a gauntlet of defiance to all corrupt potentates he predicts the near approach of calamities he foretells the certainty of divine judgment upon all sin he clothes himself with the thunders of the jewish prophets he seems to invoke woe desolation and destruction he ascribes the very invasion of the french to the justice of retribution thy crimes o florence thy crimes o rome thy crimes o italy are the causes of these chastisements and so terrible are his denunciations that the whole city quakes with fear mirandola relates that as savonarola's voice sounded like a clap of thunder in the cathedral packed to its utmost capacity with a trembling people a cold shiver ran through all his bones and the hairs of his head stood on end o rome exclaimed the preacher thou shalt be put to the sword since thou wilt not be converted o italy confusion upon confusion shall overtake thee the confusion of war shall follow thy sins and famine and pestilence shall follow after war then he denounces rome o harlot church thou hast made thy deformity apparent to all the world thou hast multiplied thy fornications in italy in france in spain in every country behold saith the lord i will stretch forth my hand upon thee i will deliver thee into the hands of those that hate thee the burden of his soul is sin sin everywhere even in the bosom of the church and the necessity of repentance of turning to the lord he is more than an elijah he is a john the baptist his sermons are chiefly drawn from the old testament especially from the prophets in their denunciation of woes like them he is stern awful sublime he does not attack the polity or the constitution of the church but its corruptions he does not call the pope a usurper a fraud an impostor he does not attack the office but if the pope is a bad man he denounces his crimes he is still the dominican monk owning his allegiance but demanding the reformation of the head of the church to whom god has given the keys of st peter neither does he meddle with the doctrines of the church he does not take much interest in the dogmas he is not a theologian but would change the habits and manners of the people of florence he would urge throughout italy a reformation of morals he sees only the degeneracy in life he threatens eternal penalties if sin be persisted in he alarms the fears of the people so that women part with their ornaments dress with more simplicity and walk more demurely licentious young men become modest and devout instead of the songs of the carnival religious hymns are sung tradesmen forsake their shops for the churches alms are more freely given great scholars become monks even children bring their offerings to the church a pyramid of vanities is burned in the public square and no wonder 
a man had appeared at a great crisis in wickedness and yet while the people were still susceptible of grand sentiments and this man venerated austere impassioned like an ancient prophet like one risen from the dead denounced his woes with such awful tones such majestic fervor such terrible emphasis as to break through all apathy all delusions and fill the people with remorse astonish them by his revelations and make them really feel that the supernatural powers armed with the terrors of omnipotence would hurl them into hell unless they repented no man in europe at the time had a more lively and impressive sense of the necessity of a general reformation than the monk of st mark but it was a reform in morals not of doctrine he saw the evils of the day yea of the church itself with perfect clearness and demanded redress he is as sad in view of these acknowledged evils as jeremiah was in view of the apostasy of the jews he is as austere in his own life as elijah or john the baptist was he would not abolish monastic institutions but he would reform the lives of the monks cure them of gluttony and sensuality not shut up their monasteries he would not rebel against the authority of the pope for even savonarola supposed that prelate to be the successor of st peter but he would prevent the pope's nepotism and luxury and worldly spirit make him once more a true servant of the servants of god even when clothed with the insignia of universal authority he would not give up auricular confession or masses for the dead or prayers to the virgin mary for these were endorsed by venerated ages but he would rebuke a priest if found in unseemly places whatever was a sin when measured by the laws of immutable immorality he would denounce whoever was guilty of it whatever would elevate the public morals he would advocate whoever opposed his morality was measured by the declaration of christ and the apostles not by the standard of a corrupt age he revered the scriptures and incessantly pondered them and exalted their authority holding them to be the ultimate rule of holy living the everlasting handbook of travellers to the heavenly jerusalem in all respects he was a good man a beautiful type of christian piety with fewer faults than luther or calvin had and as great an enemy as they to corruptions in state and church which he denounced even more fiercely and passionately not even erasmus pointed out the vices of the day with more freedom or earnestness he covered up nothing he shut his eyes to nothing end of section eight section nine of beacon lights of history volume six renaissance and reformation by john lord this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by k hand savonarola part two the difference between savonarola and luther was that the saxon reformer attacked the root of the corruption not merely outward and tangible and patent sins which everybody knew but also and more earnestly those false principles of theology and morals which sustained them and which logically pushed out would necessarily have produced them for instance he not merely attacked indulgences then a crying evil as peddled by tetzel and others like him and all to get money to support the temporal power of the popes or build st peter's church but he would show that penance on which indulgences are based is antagonistic to the doctrine which paul so forcibly expounded respecting the forgiveness of sins and the grounds of justification and luther saw that all the evils which good men lamented would continue so long as the false principles from which they logically sprung were the creed of the church so he directed his giant energies to reform doctrines rather than morals his great idea of justification could be defended only by an appeal to the scriptures not to the authority of councils and learned men so he made the scriptures the sole source of theological doctrine savonarola also accepted the scriptures but luther would put them in the hands of everybody of peasants even and thus instituted private judgment which is the basal pillar of protestantism the catholic theologians never recognized this right in the sense that luther understood it and to which he was pushed by inexorable logic the church was to remain the interpreter of the doctrinal and disputed points of the scriptures savonarola was a churchman he was not a fearless theological doctor going wherever logic and the bible carried him hence he did not stimulate thought and inquiry as luther did nor inaugurate a great revolutionary movement which would gradually undermine papal authority and many institutions which the catholic church endorsed had he been a great genius with his progressive proclivities he might have headed a rebellion against papal authority which upheld doctrines that logically supported the very evils he denounced but he was contented to lop off branches and he did not dig up roots luther went to the roots as calvin did 
as st augustine would have done had there been a necessity in his day for the theology of st augustine and calvin is essentially the same it was from st augustine that calvin drew his inspiration next after st paul but savonarola cared very little for the discussion of doctrines he probably hated all theological speculations all metaphysical divinity yet there is a closer resemblance between doctrines and morals than most people are aware of as a man thinketh so is he hence the reforms of savonarola were temporary and were not widely extended for he did not kindle the intelligence of the age as did luther and those associated with him there can be no great and lasting reform without an appeal to reason without the assistance of logic without conviction the house that had been swept and garnished was re-entered by devils and the last state was worse than the first to have effected a radical and lasting reform savonarola should have gone deeper he should have exposed the foundations on which the superstructure of sin was built he should have undermined them and appealed to the reason of the world he did no such thing he simply rebuked the evils which must needs be so long as the root of them is left untouched and so long as his influence remained so long as his voice was listened to he was mighty in the reforms at which he aimed a reformation of the morals of those to whom he preached but when his voice was hushed the evils he detested returned since he had not created those convictions which bind men together in association he had not fanned that spirit of inquiry which is hostile to ecclesiastical despotism and which logically projected would subvert the papal throne the reformation of luther was a grand protest against spiritual tyranny it not only aimed at a purer life but it opposed the bondage of the middle ages and all the superstitions and puerilities and fables which were born and nurtured in that dark and gloomy period and to which the clergy clung as a means of power or wealth luther called out the intellect of germany exalted liberty of conscience and appealed to the dignity of reason he showed the necessity of learning in order to unravel and explain the truths of revelation he made piety more exalted by giving it an intelligent stimulus he looked to the future rather than the past he would make use in his interpretation of the bible of all that literature science and art could contribute hence his writings had a wider influence than could be produced by the fascination of personal eloquence on which savonarola relied but which luther made only accessory again the sermons of the florentine reformer do not impress us as they did those to whom they were addressed they are not logical nor doctrinal nor learned not rich in thought like the sermons of those divines whom the reformation produced they are vehement denunciations of sin are eloquent appeals to the heart to religious fears and hopes he would indeed create faith in the world not by the dissertations of paul but by the agonies of the dying christ he does not instruct he does not reason he is dogmatic and practical he is too earnest to be metaphysical or even theological he takes it for granted that his hearers knew all the truths necessary for salvation he enforces the truths with which they are familiar not those to be developed by reason and learning he appeals he urges he threatens he even prophesies he dwells on divine wrath and judgment he is an isaiah foretelling what will happen rather than a peter at the day of pentecost savonarola was transcendent in his oratorical gifts the like of which has never before nor since been witnessed in italy he was a born orator as vehement as demosthenes as passionate as chrysostom as electrical as bernard nothing could withstand him he was a torrent that bore everything before him his voice was musical his attitude commanding his gestures superb he was all alive with his subject he was terribly in earnest as if he believed everything he said and that what he said were most momentous truths he fastened his burning eyes upon his hearers who listened with breathless attention and inspired them with his sentiments he made them feel that they were in the very jaws of destruction and that there was no hope but in immediate repentance his whole frame quivered with emotion and he sat down utterly exhausted his language was intense not clothing new thoughts but riveting old ideas the ideas of the middle ages the fear of hell the judgments of almighty god who could resist such fiery earnestness such a convulsed frame such quivering tones such burning eyes such dreadful threatenings such awful appeals he was not artistic in the use of words and phrases like bordelow but he reached the conscience and the heart like whitfield he never sought to amuse he would not stoop to any trifling he told no stories he made no witticisms he used no tricks he fell back on truths no matter whether his hearers relished them or not no matter whether they were amused or not he was the messenger of god urging men to flee as for their lives like lot when he escaped from sodom 
savonarola's manner was as effective as his matter he was a kind of peter the hermit preaching a crusade arousing emotions and passions and making everybody feel as he felt it was life more than thought which marked his eloquence his voice as well as his ideas his wonderful electricity which every preacher must have or he preaches to stones it was himself even more than his truths which made people listen admire and quake all real orators impress themselves their own individuality on their auditors they are not actors who represent other people and whom we admire in proportion to their artistic skill in producing deception these artists excite admiration make us forget where we are and what we are but kindle no permanent emotions and teach no abiding lessons the eloquent preacher of momentous truths and interests makes us realize them in proportion as he feels them himself they would fall dead upon us if ever so grand unless intensified by passion fervor sincerity earnestness even a voice has power when electrical musical impassioned although it may utter platitudes but when the impassioned voice rings with trumpet notes through a vast audience appealing to what is dearest to the human soul lifting the mind to the contemplation of the sublimest truths and most momentous interests then there is real eloquence such as is never heard in the theatre interested as spectators may be in the triumphs of dramatic art but i have dwelt too long on the characteristics of that eloquence which produced such a great effect on the people of florence in the latter part of the fifteenth century that ardent intense and lofty monk world deep like dante not world wide like shakespeare who filled the cathedral church with eager listeners was not destined to uninterrupted triumphs his career was short he could not even retain his influence as the english people wearied of the yoke of a puritan protector and hankered for their old pleasures so the florentines remembered the sports and spectacles and fetes of the old medician rule savonarola had arrayed against himself the enemies of popular liberty the patrons of demoralizing excitements the partisans of the banished medici and even the friends and counsellors of the pope the dreadful denunciation of sin in high place was as offensive to the pope as the exposure of a tyrannical usurpation was to the family of the old lords of florence and his enemies took counsel together and schemed for his overthrow if the irritating questions and mockeries of socrates could not be endured at athens how could the bitter invectives and denunciations of savonarola find favor at florence the fate of prophets is to be stoned martyrdom and persecution in some form or other are as inevitable to the man who sails against the stream as a broken constitution and a diseased body are to a sensualist a glutton or a drunkard impatience under rebuke is as certain as the operation of natural law the bitterest and most powerful enemy of the prior of st mark was the pope himself alexander the sixth of the infamous family of the borgias since his private vices were exposed and by one whose order had been especially devoted to the papal empire in the eyes of the wicked pope the florentine reformer was a traitor and conspirator disloyal and dangerous at first he wished to silence him by soft and deceitful letters and tempting bribes offering to him a cardinal's hat and inviting him to rome but savonarola refused alike the bribe and the invitation his lenten sermons became more violent and daring if i have preached and written anything heretical said this intrepid monk i am willing to make a public recantation i have always shown obedience to my church but it is my duty to obey god rather than man this sounds like luther at the diet of worms but he was more defenceless than luther since the saxon reformer was protected by powerful princes and was backed by the enthusiasm of northern germans yet the florentine preacher boldly continued his attacks on all hypocritical religion and on the vices of rome not as incidental to the system but extraneous the faults of a man or age the pope became furious to be thus balked by a dominican monk and in one of the cities of italy a city that had not rebelled against his authority he complained bitterly to the florentine ambassador of the haughty friar who rebuked and defied him he summoned a consistory of fourteen eminent dominican theologians to inquire into his conduct and opinions and issued a brief forbidding him to preach under penalty of excommunication yet savonarola continued to preach and more violently than ever he renewed his charges against rome he even called her a harlot church against whom heaven and earth angels and devils equally brought charges the pope then seized the old thunderbolts of the gregories and the clements and excommunicated the daring monk and preacher and threatened the like punishment on all who should befriend him and yet savonarola continued to preach 
all rome and italy talked of the audacity of the man and it was not until florence itself was threatened with an interdict for shielding such a man that the magistrates of the city were compelled to forbid his preaching the great orator mounted his pulpit march eighteenth fourteen ninety eight now four hundred years ago and took an affectionate farewell of the people whom he had led and appealed to christ himself as the head of the church it was not till the preacher was silenced by the magistrates of his own city that he seems to have rebelled against the papal authority and then not so much against the authority of rome as against the wicked shepherd himself who had usurped the fold he now writes letters to all the prominent kings and princes of europe to assemble a general council for the general council of constance had passed a resolution that the pope must call a general council every ten years and that should he neglect to assemble it the sovereign powers of the various states and empires were themselves empowered to collect the scattered members of the universal church to deliberate on its affairs in his letter to the kings of france england spain and hungary and the emperor of germany he denounced the pope as simoniacal as guilty of all the vices as a disgrace to the station which he held these letters seem to have been directed against the man not against the system he aimed at the pope's ejectment from office rather than at the subversion of the office itself another mark of the difference between savonarola and luther since the latter waged an uncompromising war against rome herself against the whole regime and government and institutions and dogmas of the catholic church and that is the reason why catholics hate luther so bitterly and deny to him either virtues or graces and represent even his deathbed as a scene of torment and despair an instance of that pursuing hatred which goes beyond the grave like that of the zealots of the revolution in france who dug up the bones of the ancient kings from those vaults where they had reposed for centuries and scattered their ashes to the wind savonarola hoped the christian world would come to his rescue but his letters were intercepted and reached the eye of alexander the sixth who now bent the whole force of the papal empire to destroy that bold reformer who had assailed his throne and it seems that a change took place in florence itself in popular sentiment the medician party obtained the ascendancy in the government the people the fickle people began to desert savonarola and especially when he refused to undergo the ordeal of fire one of the relics of mediaeval superstition the people felt that they had been cheated out of their amusement for they had waited impatiently the whole day in the public square to see the spectacle he finally consented to undergo the ordeal provided he might carry the crucifix to this his enemies would not consent he then laid aside the crucifix but insisted on entering the fire with the sacrament in his hand his persecutors would not allow this either and the ordeal did not take place at last his martyrdom approaches he is led to prison the magistrates of the city send to rome for absolution for having allowed the prior to preach his enemies busy themselves in collecting evidence against him for what i know not except that he had denounced corruption and sin and had predicted woe his two friends are imprisoned and interrogated with him fra domenico da pescia and fra silvestro marufi who are willing to die for him he and they are now subjected to most cruel tortures as a result of bodily agony his mind begins to waver his answers are coherent he implores his tormentors to end his agonies he cries out with a voice enough to melt a heart of stone take o oh, take my life yet he confessed nothing to criminate himself what they wished him especially to confess was that he had pretended to be a prophet since he had predicted calamities but all men are prophets in one sense when they declare the certain penalties of sin from which no one can escape though we take the wings of the morning and fly to the uttermost parts of the sea savonarola thus far had remained firm but renewed examinations and fresh tortures took place for a whole month his torments were continuous in one day he was drawn up by a rope fourteen times and then suddenly dropped until all his muscles quivered with anguish had he been surrounded by loving disciples like latimer at the burning pile he might have summoned more strength but alone in a dark inquisitorial prison subjected to increasing torture among bitter foes he did not fully defend his visions and prophecies and then his extorted confessions were diabolically altered but that was all they could get out of him that he had prophesied in all matters of faith he was sound the inquisitors were obliged to bring their examination to an end they could find no fault with him and yet they were determined on his death the government of florence consented to it and hastened it for a medici again held the highest office of the state nothing remained to the imprisoned and tortured friar but to prepare for his execution in his supreme trial he turned to the god in whom he believed in the words of the dying xavier on the island of sancian he exclaimed in te domine speravi non confundar in eternum 
O Lord, he prays, a thousand times thou hast wiped out my iniquity. I do not rely on my own justification, but on thy mercy. His few remaining days in prison were passed in holy meditation. At last the officers of the papal commission arrive. The tortures are renewed, and also the examinations with the same result. No fault could be found with his doctrines. But a dead enemy, said they, fights no more. He is condemned to execution. The messengers of death arrive at his cell, and find him on his knees. He is overpowered by his sufferings and vigils, and can with difficulty be kept from sleep. But he arouses himself, and passes the night in prayer, and administers the element of redemption to his doomed companions, and closes with this prayer. Lord, I know thou art that perfect Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I know that thou art the eternal word, that thou didst descend from heaven into the bosom of Mary, that thou didst ascend upon the cross to shed thy blood for our sins. I pray thee that by that blood I may have remission for my sins. The simple faith of Paul, of Augustine, of Pascal he then partook of the communion and descended to the public square while the crowd gazed silently and with trepidation and was led with his companions to the first tribunal where he was disrobed of his ecclesiastical dress then they were led to another tribunal and delivered to the secular arm then to another where sentence of death was read and then to the place of execution not a burning funeral pyre but a scaffold which mounting composed calm absorbed savonarola submitted his neck to the hangman in the forty-fifth year of his life a martyr to the cause of christ not for an attack on the church or its doctrines or its institutions but for having denounced the corruption and vices of those who ruled it for having preached against sin thus died one of the greatest and best men of his age one of the truest and purest whom the catholic church has produced in any age he was stern uncompromising austere but a reformer and a saint a man who was merciful and generous in the possession of power an enlightened statesman a sound theologian and a fearless preacher of that righteousness which exalteth a nation he had no vices no striking defects he lived according to the rules of the convent he governed with the same wisdom that he governed in a city and he died in the faith of the primitive apostles his piety was monastic but his spirit was progressive sympathizing with liberty advocating public morality he was unselfish disinterested and true to his church his conscience and his cause a noble specimen both of a man and christian whose deeds and example form part of the inheritance of an admiring posterity we pity his closing days after such a career of power and influence but we may as well compassionate socrates or paul the greatest lights of the world have gone out in martyrdom to be extinguished however only for a time and then to loom up again in another age and burn with inextinguishable brightness to remotest generations as examples of the power of faith and truth in this wicked rebellious world a world to be finally redeemed by the labors and religion of just such men whose days are days of sadness protest and suffering and whose hours of triumph and exaltation are not like those of conquerors nor like those whose eyes stand out with fatness but few and far between i have loved righteousness i have hated iniquity said the great champion of the medieval church and therefore i die in exile in ten years after this ignominious execution raphael painted the martyr among the sainted doctors of the church in the halls of the vatican and future popes did justice to his memory for he inaugurated that reform movement in the catholic church itself which took place within fifty years after his death in one sense he was the precursor of loyola of xavier of aquaviva those illustrious men who headed the counter-reformation jesuits indeed but ardent in piety and enlightened by the spirit of a progressive age he was the first says viari in the fifteenth century to make men feel that a new light had awakened the human race and thus he was a prophet of a new civilization the forerunner of luther of bacon of descartes hence the drama of his life became after his death the drama of europe in the course of a single generation after luther had declared his mission the spirit of the church of rome underwent a change from the halls of the vatican to the secluded hermitages of the apiens this revival was felt instead of a borgia there reigned a carafa and it is remarkable that from the day that the counter-reformation in the catholic church was headed by the early jesuits protestantism gained no new victories and in two centuries so far declined in piety and zeal that the cities which witnessed the noblest triumphs of luther and calvin 
were disgraced by a boasting rationalism to be succeeded again in our times by an arrogance of skepticism which has had no parallel since the days of democritus and lucretius it was the desire of savonarola that reason religion and liberty might meet in harmonious union but he did not think a new system of religious doctrines was necessary the influence of such a man cannot pass away and has not passed away for it cannot be doubted that his views have been embraced by enlightened catholics from his day to ours by such men as pascal fenelon and la Cordiere, and thousands like them who prefer ritualism and auricular confession and penance monasticism and an ecclesiastical monarch and all the machinery of a complicated hierarchy with all the evils growing out of papal domination to rationalism sectarian dissensions irreverence license want of unity want of government and even dispensation from the marriage vow which is worse the physical arm of the beast or the maniac soul of a lying prophet which is worse the superstition and narrowness which excludes the bible from schools or that unbounded toleration which smiles on those audacious infidels who cloak their cruel attacks on the faith of christians with the name of a progressive civilization and so far advanced that one of these new lights ignorant perhaps of everything except of the fossils and shells and bugs and gases of the hole he has bored in assumes to know more of the mysteries of creation and the laws of the universe than moses and david and paul and all the bacons and newtons that ever lived names are nothing it is the spirit the animus which is everything it is the soul which permeates a system that i look at it is the devil from which i would flee whatever be his name and though he assume the form of an angel of light or cunningly try to persuade me and ingeniously argue that there is no god true and good catholics and true and good protestants have ever been united in one thing in this belief that there is a god who made the heaven and the earth and that there is a christ who made atonement for the sins of the world it is good morals faith and love to which both catholics and protestants are exhorted by the apostles when either catholics or protestants accept the one faith and the one lord which christianity alone reveals then they equally belong to the grand army of spiritual warriors under the banner of the cross though they may march under different generals and in different divisions and they will receive the same consolations in this world and the same rewards in the world to come authorities viari's life of savonarola biographie universe ranks history of the popes there is much in romola by george eliot Life of Savonarola by the Prince of Mirandola. End of section 9. Section 10 of Beacon Lights of History, Volume 6, Renaissance and Reformation by John Lord. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by K. Hand. Michelangelo, Part 1. A.D. 1475 to 1564. The Revival of Art michelangelo bonarotti one of the great lights of the new civilization may stand as the most fitting representative of reviving art in europe also as an illustrious example of those virtues which dignify intellectual preeminence he was superior in all that is sterling and grand in character to any man of his age certainly in italy exhibiting a rugged stern greatness which reminds us of dante and of other great benefactors nurtured in the school of sorrow and disappointment, leading a checkered life, doomed to envy, ingratitude, and neglect. Rarely understood, and never fully appreciated, even by those who employed and honored him. He was an isolated man, grave, abstracted, lonely, yet not unhappy, since his world was that of glorious and exalting ideas, even those of grace, beauty, majesty, and harmony the world which plato lived in and in which all great men live who seek to rise above the transient the false and puerile in common life he was also an original genius remarkable in everything he attempted whether as a sculptor painter or architect and even as poet he saw the archetypes of everything beautiful and grand which are invisible except to those who are almost divinely gifted and he had the practical skill to embody them in permanent forms so that all ages may study those forms and rise through them to the realms in which his soul lived michelangelo not only created but he reproduced he reproduced the glories of grecian and roman art he restored the old civilization in his pictures his statues and his grand edifices he revived a taste for what is imperishable in antiquity as such he is justly regarded as an immortal benefactor for it is art which gives to nations culture refinement and the enjoyment of the beautiful 
art diverts the mind from low and commonplace pursuits exalts the imagination and makes votary indifferent to the evils of life it raises the soul into regions of peace and bliss but art is most ennobling when it is inspired by lofty and consecrated sentiments like those of religion patriotism and love now ancient art was consecrated to paganism of course there were noble exceptions but as a general rule temples were erected in honor of heathen deities statues represented mere physical strength and beauty and grace pictures portrayed the charms of an unsanctified humanity hence ancient art did little to arrest human degeneracy facilitated rather than retarded the ruin of states and empires since it did not stimulate the virtues on which the strength of man is based it did not check those depraved tastes and habits which are based on egotism now the restorers of ancient art cannot be said to have contributed to the moral elevation of the new races unless they avoided the sensualism of greece and rome and appealed purely to those eternal ideas which the human mind even under pagan influences sometimes conceived and which do not conflict with christianity itself in considering the life and labors of michelangelo then we are to examine whether in the classical glories of antiquity which he substituted for the gothic and medieval he advanced civilization in the noblest sense and moreover whether he carried art to a higher degree than was ever attained by the greeks and romans and hence became a benefactor of the world in considering these points i shall not attempt a minute criticism of his works i can only seize on the great outlines the salient points of those productions which have given him immortality no lecture can be exhaustive if it only prove suggestive it has reached its end michelangelo stands out in history in the three aspects of sculptor painter and architect and that too in a country devoted to art and in an age when italy won all her modern glories arising from the matchless works which that age produced indeed those works will probably never be surpassed since all the energies of a great nation were concentrated upon their production even as our own age confines itself chiefly to mechanical inventions and scientific research and speculation what railroads and telegraphs and spindles and chemical tests and compounds are to us what philosophy was to the greeks what government and jurisprudence were to the romans what cathedrals and metaphysical subtleties were to the middle ages what theological inquiries were to the divines of the seventeenth century what social urbanities and refinements were to the french in the eighteenth century the fine arts were to the italians in the sixteenth century a fact too commonplace to dwell upon and which will be conceded when we bear in mind that no age has been distinguished for everything and that nations can try satisfactorily but one experiment at a time and are not likely to repeat it with the same enthusiasm as the mind is unbounded in its capacities and our world affords inexhaustible fields of enterprise the progress of the race is to be seen in the new developments which successively appear but in which only a certain limit has thus far been reached not in absolute perfection in any particular sphere is this progress seen but rather in the variety of the experiments it may be doubted whether any grecian edifice will ever surpass the parthenon in beauty of proportion or fitness of ornament or any nude statues show grace of form more impressive than the venus de milo or the apollo belvedere or any system of jurisprudence be more completely codified than that systemized by justinian or any gothic church rival the lofty expression of cologne cathedral or any painting surpass the holy serenity and ethereal love depicted in raphael's madonnas or any court witness such a brilliant assemblage of wits and beauties as met at versailles to render homage to louis the fourteenth or any theological discussion excite such a national interest as when luther confronted dr eck in the great hall of the electoral palace at Leipzig or any theatrical excitement such as was produced on cultivated intellects when garrick and siddons represented the sublime conceptions of the myriad-minded shakespeare these glories may reappear but never will they shine as they did before no more olympian games no more roman triumphs no more dodona oracles no more flavian amphitheatres no more mediaeval cathedrals no more councils of nice or trent no more spectacles of kings holding the stirrups of popes no more fields of the cloth of gold no more reigns of court mistresses in such palaces as versailles and fontainebleau ah i wish i could add no more such battlefields as marengo and waterloo only copies and imitations of these and without the older charm the world is moving on and perpetually changing nor can we tell what new vanity will next arise vanity or glory according to our varying notions of the dignity and destiny of man 
we may predict that it will not be any mechanical improvement for ere long the limit will be reached and it will be reached when the great mass cannot find work to do for the everlasting destiny of man is toil and labor but it will be some sublime wonders of which we cannot now conceive and which in time will pass away for other wonders and novelties until the great circle is completed and all human experiments shall verify the moral wisdom of the eternal revelation then all that man has done all that man can do in his own boastful thought will be seen in the light of the celestial verities to be indeed a vanity and a failure not of human ingenuity and power but to realize the happiness which is only promised as the result of supernatural not mortal strength yet which the soul in its restless aspirations never ceases its efforts to secure everlasting babel building to reach the unattainable on earth now the revival of art in italy was one of the great movements in the series of human development it peculiarly characterized the fifteenth and sixteenth centuries it was an age of artistic wonders of great creations italy especially was glorious when michelangelo was born fourteen seventy four when the rest of europe was comparatively rude and when no great works in art in poetry in history or philosophy had yet appeared he was descended from an illustrious family and was destined to one of the learned professions but he could not give up his mind to anything but drawing as annoying to his father as galileo's experiments were to his parent as unmeaning to him as gibbon's history was to george the third scribble 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 mr gibbon i perceive sir you are always a scribblin no perception of a new power no sympathy with the abandonment to a specialty not endorsed by fashions and traditions but without which abandonment genius cannot easily be developed at last the father yielded and the son was apprenticed to a painter a degradation in the eyes of medieval aristocracy the celebrated lorenzo de medici was then in the height of power and fame in florence adored by roscoe as the patron of artists and poets although he subverted the liberties of his country this overlauded prince heir of the fortunes of a great family of merchants wishing to establish a school for sculpture filled a garden with statues and freely admitted to it young scholars in art michelangelo was one of the most frequent and enthusiastic visitors to this garden where in due time he attracted the attention of the magnificent lord of florence by a head chiselled so remarkably that he became an inmate of the palace sat at the table of lorenzo and at last was regularly adopted as one of the prince's family with every facility for prosecuting his studies before he was eighteen the youth had sculptured the battle of hercules with the centaurs which he would never part with and which still remains in his family so well done that he himself at the age of eighty regretted that he had not given up his whole life to sculpture it was then as a sculptor that michelangelo first appears to the historical student about the year fourteen ninety two when columbus was crossing the great unknown ocean to realize his belief in a western passage to india thus commercial enterprise began with the revival of art and was destined never to be separated in its alliance with it since commerce brings wealth and wealth seeks to ornament the palaces and gardens which it has created or purchased the sculptor's art was not born until piety had already edifices in which to worship god or pride the monuments in which it sought the glories of a name but it made rapid progress as wealth increased and taste became refined as the need was felt for ornaments and symbols to adorn naked walls and empty spaces especially sanctuary grouped or single of men or animals a marble history to interpret or reproduce consecrated associations churches might do without them the glass stained in every color of the rainbow the altar shining with gold and silver and precious stones the pillars multiplied and diversified and rich in foliated circles mullions mouldings groins and bosses and bearing aloft the arched and ponderous roof one scene of dazzling magnificence these could do without them but the palaces and halls and houses of the rich required the image of man and of man not emaciated and worn and monstrous but of man as he appeared to the classical greeks in the perfection of form and physical beauty so the artists who arose with the revival of commerce with the multiplication of human wants and the study of antiquity sought to restore the buried statues with the long neglected literature and laws it was in sculptured marble that enthusiasm was most marked these were found in abundance in various parts of italy whenever the vast debris of the ancient magnificence was removed and were universally admired and prized by popes cardinals and princes and formed the nucleus of great museums 
the works of michael angelo as a sculptor were not numerous but in sublimity they have never been surpassed non multa sed multum his unfinished monument of julius the second begun at that pontiff's request as a mausoleum is perhaps his greatest work and the statue of moses which formed a part of it has been admired for three hundred years in this as in his other masterpieces grandeur and majesty are his characteristics it may have been a reproduction and yet it is not a copy he made character and moral force the first consideration and form subservient to expression and here he differed it is said by great critics from the ancients who thought more of form than of moral expression as may be seen in the faces of the venus de medici and the apollo belvedere matchless and inimitable as these statues are in grace and beauty le laocoon and the dying gladiator are indeed exceptions for it is character which constitutes their chief merit the expression of pain despair and agony but there is almost no intellectual or moral expression in the faces of other famous and remarkable antique statues only beauty and variety of form such as powers exhibited in his greek slave an inferior excellence since it is much easier to copy the beautiful in the nude statues which people italy than to express such intellectual majesty as michael angelo conceived that intellectual expression which story has succeeded in giving to his african sibyl thus while the great artist retained the antique he superadded a loftiness such as the ancients rarely produced and sculpture became in his hands not demoralizing and pagan resplendent and sensual charms but instructive and exalting instructive for the marvellous display of anatomical knowledge and exalting from grand conceptions of dignity and power his knowledge of anatomy was so remarkable that he could work without models our artists in these days must always have before their eyes some nude figure to copy the same peculiarities which have given him fame as a sculptor he carried out into painting in which he is even more remarkable for the artists of italy at this period often combined a skill for all the fine arts in sculpture they were much indebted to the ancients but painting seems to have been purely a development in the middle ages it was comparatively rude no noted painter arose until Simabu in the middle of the thirteenth century before him painting was a lifeless imitation of models afforded by greek workers in mosaics but Simabu abandoned this servile copying and gave a new expression to heads and grouped his figures under giotto who was contemporary with dante drawing became still more correct and coloring softer after him painting was rapidly advanced pietro della francesca was the father of perspective domenico painted in oil discovered by van eck in flanders in fourteen ten masaccio studied anatomy gilding disappeared as a background around pictures in the fifteenth century the enthusiasm for painting became intense even monks became painters and every convent and church and palace was deemed incomplete without pictures but ideal beauty and harmony in coloring were still wanting as well as freedom of the pencil then arose da vinci and michelangelo who practised the immutable principles by which art could be advanced and rapidly following in their steps fra baltomeo fra angelico rossi and andrea del sarto made the age an era in painting until the art culminated in raphael and correggio and titian and diverse cities of italy bologna milan parma and venice disputed with rome and florence for the empire of art as also did many other cities which might be mentioned each of which has a history each of which is hallowed by poetic associations so that all men who have lived in italy or even visited it feel a peculiar interest in these cities an interest which they can feel in no others even if they be such capitals as london and paris i excuse this extravagant admiration for the wonderful masterpieces produced in that age making marble and canvas eloquent with the most inspiring sentiments because wrapped in the joys which they excite the cultivated and imaginative man forgets and rejoices that he can forget the priests and beggars the dirty hotels filthy friars superstition unthrift jesuitism which stare ordinary tourists in the face and all the other disgusting realities which philanthropists deplore so loudly in that degenerate but classical and ever to be hallowed land 
for come what will in spite of popes and despots it has been the scene of the highest glories of antiquity calling to our minds saints and martyrs as well as conquerors and emperors and revealing at every turn their tombs and broken monuments and all the hoary remnants of unsurpassed magnificence as well as preserving in churches and palaces those wonders which were created when italy once again lived in the noble aspiration of making herself the centre and the pride of the new civilization da vinci the oldest of the great masters who was immortalized that era died in fifteen nineteen in the arms of francis i of france and michael angelo received his mantle the young sculptor was taken away from his chisel to paint for pope julius the second the ceiling of the sistine chapel after the death of his patron lorenzo he had studied and done famous work in marble at bologna at rome and again at florence he had also painted some and with such immediate success that he had been invited to assist da vinci in decorating a hall in the ducal palace at florence but sculpture was his chosen art and when called to paint the sistine chapel he implored the pope that he might be allowed to finish the mausoleum which he had begun and that raphael then dazzling the whole city by his unprecedented talent might be substituted for him in that great work but the pope was inflexible and the great artist began his task assisted by other painters however he soon got disgusted with them and sent them away and worked alone for twenty months he toiled rarely seen living abstemiously absorbed utterly in his work of creation and the greater portion of the compartments in the vast ceiling was finished before any other voice than his except the admiring voice of the pope pronounced it good it would be useless to attempt to describe those celebrated frescoes their subjects were taken from the book of genesis with great figures of sibyls and prophets they are now half concealed by the accumulated dust and smoke of three hundred years and can be surveyed only by reclining at full length on the back we see enough however to be impressed with the boldness the majesty and the originality of the figures their fidelity to nature the knowledge of anatomy displayed and the disdain of inferior arts especially the noble disdain of appealing to false and perverted tastes as if he painted from an exalted ideal in his own mind which ideal is ever associated with creative power it is this creative power which places michelangelo at the head of the artists of his great age and not merely the power to create but the power of realizing the most exalted conceptions raphael was doubtless superior to him in grace and beauty even as titian afterwards surpassed him in coloring he delighted like dante in the awful and the terrible this grandeur of conception was especially seen in his last judgment executed thirty years afterwards in completion of the sistine chapel the work on which had been suspended at the death of julius this vast fresco is nearly seventy feet in height painted upon the wall at the end of the chapel as an altarpiece no subject could have been better adapted to his genius than this the day of supernal terrors dies irae dies ila when according to the sentiments of the middle ages the doomed were subjected to every variety of physical suffering and when this agony of pain rather than agony of remorse was expressed in tortured limbs and in faces writhing with demoniacal despair such was the variety of tortures which he expressed showing an unexampled richness in imaginative powers that people came to see it from the remotest parts of italy it made a great sensation like the appearance of an immortal poem and was magnificently rewarded for the painter received a pension of twelve hundred golden crowns a year a great sum in that age End of section ten.